Mexico is hardly a hidden gem when it comes to travel destinations. And nowhere in Mexico is more popular than the Yucatan Peninsula. Encompassing the states of Quintana Roo, the Yucatan, and Campeche, this region in the south of Mexico is home to beautiful beaches and popular tourist destinations like Cancun, Tulum, and Cozumel. But it's so much more than just beaches and margaritas. It's home to a rich Mayan culture, unique biodiversity, and incredible food. In this two-hour video, we're showing you a different side to the Yucatan, taking you with us on our two-month RV road trip across the Yucatan Peninsula in 2021. This video is about the road less traveled, going beyond the tourist hotspots, and sharing some of the best things to do in this region. If you want more help as you follow in our footsteps, RVing the Yucatan Peninsula too, make sure to grab our 75 page digital guide, which shares all of these amazing destinations in this video, along with so much more, like how to prepare your vehicle, what to bring, how to cross the border, find camping, get safe drinking water, safety concerns, and so much more. So sit back, strap in, and get ready for a wild adventure RVing the Yucatan Peninsula. This road trip begins in the sleepy beach town of Isla Guada. As our viewers who are traveling 21 states across Mexico on this trip, Isla Guada is considered the start for most RV routes through the Yucatan. However, if you're heading here by plane and want to do a road trip across the Yucatan Peninsula, fly into Cancun and rent a car where you can explore the rest of these wonderful regions. If you're new here, we attempted to RV the Yucatan in the spring of 2020. And well, we all know what happened in the spring of 2020. We ended up making it to this beautiful beachside RV park right when the pandemic broke out, where we stayed for the next three months in isolation. We became extremely close with the wonderful owner, Thelma, of Freedom Shores RV Park and Hotel, and we couldn't be happier to be back here visiting with her. We made it back to Isla Oquada, beautiful Campeche, Mexico, and it is now a Pueblo Mexico. Muy bien, bien trabajo, Isla Aguada. Yeah, felicidades. We're really excited to just be able to relax here over the next week. We're going to take advantage of endless beach views, mm -hmm. the sounds of waves crashing next to our RV, sunsets, sunrises. No, we're not going to take advantage no of sunrises, sunrise. but. Amazing how quickly we fall back into like our habits. We've been here for just for a few days, but we're like back on working out every day. We're waking up early. We're catching up on all this work. It's, true. it's just like being here. You don't want to go out and explore all the places because being here yeah. is so beautiful and incredible in its own way. It's like, why would you even want to go anywhere else? The hotel literally has everything you need. Unless you go on an excursion, like the dolphin tour or something, there's no reason to leave really. <laughs> oh, it's heaven. Yeah. Okay, I'm hungry. Let's go eat. And today we're gonna to do something special. We wanted to do this the first time we were here for three months, but of course COVID shut literally everything down on the island. But today we're gonna to go look for some dolphins. <laughs> Can't wait to see them. I hope I know we're gonna see them. I just saw one. Oh, I just saw another one. just going to see dolphins today. We're also going to go to two islands. One is called Bird Island, which is kind of off in the distance from where we stay in Isla Aguada. And there's also Concha Island, which is Shell Island.
jumping off the boat so we can explore a little island that you can't get to by foot. No dolphins as of yet. Disappointing, but that's any nature tour. You're never guaranteed to be able to see the animals. It is wildlife and that's part of it, right? And this island is gorgeous. There might be a dolphin. about to head back to the hotel. We went out into the pass by the bridge and we saw two. We're back. That was fun. It was. It ended up being closer to three hours, which is nice. Uh -huh. And they definitely made sure that we got like time. If we asked for more time in a spot, they would give it to us. I think it was worth, you know, the price we paid. I wish we could have spent a little bit more time at Shell Island because that was just such a beautiful secluded island that had awesome water to swim in and a bunch of shells to like walk around and pick through. Now we're just going to have some micheladas and, uh, well, when I say we, Dennis is going to have some micheladas. Jeez. There's going to be lots of hammock time. Reading, relaxing, lazy Sunday. It's our last day in East La Guada. A week flew by so fast. Way too fast. <laughs> but we're going to make the most of it. To start, we're going swimming. Swimming. Let's go. relaxed, we're enjoying the sunset, we've seen so many dolphins. A lot of dolphins today, like and more than usual. Oh, for sure. So now we're going to treat ourselves to one last meal at the restaurant. I mean, you can't go wrong, there's like fresh seafood that's so tasty for like under $20 per meal. It's, I mean, come on. With micheladas and I what found out that this is called a chelada, okay. which is lime juice with a cerveza. Mm -hmm. So a chelada. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to remember that. Chelada. Mi chelada. Enjoy. Hard as it was to say goodbye, we headed north about two hours to the city of Campeche. We are officially in the capital city of the state of Campeche, which is Campeche City. This is our first official trek into the Yucatan Peninsula. And it's everything we kind of imagined. These very colonial cities with beautiful, bright pastel color buildings, Tons of churches and gorgeous courtyards. This city is definitely charming, romantic, all of the things, and we're so excited to show you around. If you've watched other Campeche videos because you're planning a trip here, you're probably gonna see a lot of people going to the same restaurants, and that's because they're great. Marganza was recommended to us by a local we just met as we were parking. He said it was delicious. Very good way to try traditional Campeche food. And to start off, 
I got a horchata de coco. Normally horchata is a rice drink, but it can also be made with different ingredients. This one is made from coconut. I got empanadas de chaya, which chaya is a Mayan plant, and it's filled with cheese. I don't know that I would be able to really recognize the chaya. It's not like a super distinct flavor. The cheese is wonderful, and it's deep fried dough, so you really can't go wrong. <laughs> I went for the Panuchos de Cochinita Pepillo. Uh huh. Probably my favorite thing. A very famous dish is pan de cazón, where they take a tortilla and then they layer it with cazón, which is a type of shark, and then it has like a red sauce all over it with spices. It's supposed to be very good, but I asked our server and she suggested the stuffed chili version of it. This is made with dogfish, not sharks. It's very tasty, I love the flavors of it, but it does have like a kind of fishy, fishy taste to it. It's interesting. Would I order it again? Am I glad I got to experience it? Yes. Spanish conquistadors began occupying the Maya region of the Yucatan Peninsula around 1517, growing San Francisco de Campeche into one of the largest trading ports in the New World. To protect the city from pirates who were abundant from the 16th to 18th centuries, the Spanish built a series of thick stone walls and eight bastions to fortify the city during the 17th century. Inside the fortress walls, you'll find colorful churches and buildings built in traditional Spanish colonial architecture. mixed in with beautiful plazas among perfectly straight streets. One of the churches, Ex Templo de San Jose, has a lighthouse on top because of the proximity to the sea, originally helping keep ships from crashing into the fortress walls. There are two historic entrances into the fortified city. One seaside, Puerto de Mar, which used to touch the ocean tide when the fortress was originally built. The other on the inland side, Puerto de Tierra, which was secured a bit more intensely to protect the wealthier neighborhoods. Connecting them is Campeche's famous Calle 59, a now pedestrian-only street lined with outdoor dining and plenty of shopping opportunities. Inside the eight bastions, there are small museums that can be visited, and in some spots, grant you access to the top of the fortress. So we visited Puerto de Tierra and paid 15 pesos each to visit their small museum and be able to explore the city from the top of the fortress walls. to alert the people that the pirates were coming. Are you protecting us from pirates? I would be a pirate. But it is kind of crazy, like, the amount of thinking and engineering went into these forts like the shapes of the portholes so they could aim the musket guns and have cover at the same time is uh it's pretty cool like thinking about that kind of stuff pretty rad but i would not want to have to live back when a bunch of pirates were attacking my city on a constant basis Pirates are 
attacking. I'm glad we came to the uh, perimeter wall walk because this actually feels a lot like St. Augustine, Florida, which I spent a lot of my youth visiting. Super old Spanish colonial construction type fort near the beach that was built with a purpose. You know, palm trees, lots of humidity, lots of sunshine, old rusty cannons. Brings back, brings back the good old days. say the historic center that's inside of the wall fort is pretty small you can walk from one corner to the other of it in probably like 15 minutes max and that's taking your time so you can see everything inside of the historic uh, center unless you're going into the museums probably and spending a lot of time in each museum in one day or if you prefer, there is a trolley that will take you around on an hour tour. If you speak Spanish or understand Spanish, they give you all of the history of the area. It's 100 pesos per person. We opted to just walk by foot. We also have the scooter to get around and be able to view the beautiful streets and colors. But it's definitely a nice way to get introduced to the city, even if you only have one day. I can't get enough of the buildings. They are beautiful. You can see the Spanish influence here. Just the, the history and the colonial architecture of it is gorgeous. Unfortunately, a lot of the buildings are completely abandoned. You can see when you're on top of the fort, all of the ones that have roofs caved in, there's trees growing where there would be. It's just raw ground. But there's been a few places that actually have doors open and you can see inside and see some of their gorgeous decorations and just how beautiful and ornate some of these places probably are. Well, the day has turned on us. It started raining, so now we're just drinking. <laughs> I got more horchata, but this time there's rum. I don't think you can make horchata much better, but if you add rum, you made it better. Because Campeche is west facing, you can normally enjoy pretty epic sunsets. But unfortunately, the weather rained on our sunset parade. So instead, we enjoyed the sights of the city at night. Then headed over to La Maria Cocina Peninsular for happy hour and a super delicious dinner. We finished the night off at the Malacón, which has a water light show two times each night for you to enjoy. One spot that you should definitely check out if you're coming to Campeche is the Malacón. It's a several kilometer or mile long run where people can exercise, bike, walk, and just enjoy the beautiful waterfront. It's also where you'll find the sign for Campeche, which Mexico has signs for all of their cities in these colorful letters. It's kind of like their signature mark and a statue of an angel. One thing I will say about visiting Campeche City, for us as our viewers, that was frustrating was camping. It's officially 10 p.m. And the Home Depot guy just came and kicked us out of the parking lot. We got permission from the daytime manager to, to stay, stay at the Home Depot. Tonight. But they're saying that they can't get a hold of him on the phone to confirm that. So we got to leave. And we don't know where the hell we're going to go. Last night we stayed at Sam's Club. We did get permission from the manager there, but he just said for one night. Like, normally we don't allow this, but... It's already after dark, just stay. So we don't want to go back to Sam's Club, which is next door, and over welcome our stay when he clearly overstay told us. Welcome. Yeah, overstay our welcome when he clearly told us just one night. But at this point, it might just be what we do. It was quite the journey to get here, but we ended up finding a park that's right next to the Centro. It's literally a two minute walk. I can see the wall from here. Oh, we're, we're a block away from the Puerto del Mar. So it's a really good location. Big enough spots for our rig to fit perfectly. Uh, it was nice and quiet at night. There's a police station right around the corner, so we felt nice and safe. It was free. We're glad we, we're just glad we found a spot to stay last night. Yeah. All of the places we tried, except for the hotel, were listed on iOverlander as verified stays. Take iOverlander with a huge 
teaspoon of salt. It's been a really stressful night. We really enjoyed our stay here. It is such a lovely city. But our road trip continues in the Yucatan. Most people head straight to Merida, but we recommend stopping at Etzna, a smaller Mayan ruin along the way, and it's a perfect detour as you're driving north. Our next stop, though, is the tiny coastal town of Celestun. Welcome to Celestun. It's February now, and in Celestun, that is peak flamingo season. So it's pretty much guaranteed that we will see flamingos here. We already went to the boat tours and found out all the information we need to go on a fun adventure tomorrow. But for now, we're just going to enjoy our new camping spot, which is beautiful. I Overlander had several free camping spots. There's one next to the lighthouse. We probably could have even parked over by where the boat tours are for the flamingos, but we decided to come to a hotel. 200 pesos includes Wi-Fi, there's showers on site, and of course you have access to the beach. So we're gonna be enjoying a little bit of a sunset later. What do you guys want? Do you want to come outside? Okay, let's get outside. There's a horse walking by right now and I'm pretty sure our cats are going to freak out. They do not like when strangers or weird things come up to our special little safe zone. So yeah, they just freaked out. Now uh, Oliver's hiding underneath the van. Come here. Hey! There we go. That ended poorly. Yeah. Look at my claw mark. Battle wounds. we're gonna see today flamingos today's the day they actually have huge parking spots I guess for tour buses that typically come through for the day experience so we were able to park our RV in one of the big shady spots which worked out really well The Celestoon biosphere is home to hundreds of species of birds, fish, and mammals, but its claim to fame is undoubtedly its flamingo population. Wow, look at the whole herd of them. Finally, flamingos! I'm like so, so excited. As many as 35,000 flamingos migrate to Celestoon each winter, feeding on the algae that grows here. Since flamingos can't swim, December to April is the best time to view the flamingos in Celestoon or Rio Largatos because of the shallow waters, which is the perfect height for the flamingos to stand, eat, and nest comfortably. Definitely one of the top experiences we've had in all of our travels to Mexico. This is absolutely incredible.
made it to the swimming hole, which is literally like a few feet from where we just saw that, I don't know, probably 10 foot crocodile. So I'm not sure if I'm gonna be swimming today. <laughs> wow, it's beautiful. It's like completely different color water here. was freaking awesome. I'm super surprised to finally see a bubbling spring in Mexico because all the other cenotes that we swam in had just been still water access to the water table. But this one actually has a fresh water spring coming from the aquifer, mixing with the salt water that's in the biosphere and making this the perfect brackish environment for all of these fish and the flamingos. And no crocodiles. The crocodile is not very far away, but he's not in here. So that's good. Amazing. Yeah, incredible this, day. This has definitely been the best boat tour we've experienced through all of Mexico. Mm -hmm. I think you can have up to eight people on a boat. Our boat today just had six. So it ended up costing us 300 pesos per person. If you want to rent right. the boat completely by yourself, it is 1800 pesos, which is an option. Our next stop is Merida, about an hour and a half drive from Celestun. Merida is the capital of the Yucatan and considered one of the safest cities, not just in Mexico, but in all of North America. It's home for many expats here in Mexico, including our friends Greg and Karen. So we're staying just outside of the city. Thankfully, they allowed us to park it in their driveway. But if you're coming to Merida, there is a trailer park you can stay in. But this morning, we're doing one of my favorite things to do, no matter where we are in the world. Every Saturday morning, they have something called a slow food market. They have hundreds of vendors in two locations throughout the city that sell everything from meat, eggs, fish, vegetables, fruits, goods, honey. So we're going to do a little shopping this morning. So we always make the mistake where we don't eat before we come to the markets. So of course the first stall we stopped in was a lady selling empanadas and tamales. We also got something special called kiwis. I guess it's a very popular dish here in Merida and it's like a, a deep fried flour that's stuffed with typically meat or cheese. But in our case we got vegetarian versions of everything. I don't know if you're going to be able to see the detail, but there's a lot going on in here, and it is amazing. Mm, so good. And it's, not, and it's not just because I'm hungry. Like, this is legit. Really good. Let's whoop this down and keep shopping. Major success. We are all sucked up with so much healthy goodies. I just love markets like this. And this is probably the closest to a farmer's market we've seen for what we're familiar with from like the USA or Canada here in Mexico. It's definitely like a thriving community. I get why expats love Merida so much. We're going to start our time in Merida off in the Plaza Grande, which is like the Zocalo, their largest plaza. I signed up for a free walking tour. You can sign up for your own free walking tour at the Tourist Information Center in the Plaza Grande. They tell you to arrive around 9 a.m. to put your name on the list and just tip your guide at the end to show your appreciation. Merida's history dates back thousands of years as the Mayan city Tijol. After Spanish conquistador Francisco de Montejo arrived in 1542, he began tearing down the Mayan pyramids to build the colonial city we know as Merida. His home in the Plaza Grande, which you can visit for free, remains the oldest building in the city, with the facade being completed in 1549. Our guide explained the complex history between the Mayans and Spanish, and the influence it had on the culture today. While the city may not look as it once did under Mayan rule, it's estimated that as much as 80% of the people living in the Yucatan have Mayan lineage, and many still speak the Mayan language today. Spanish officials continued to reside in Merida for nearly 250 years, with the city acting as the capital for the entire Yucatan Peninsula. It wasn't long after Mexican independence in the 1800s that Merida became the wealthiest city in Mexico. 
that was until nylon was invented and the industry was left in shambles, leaving many of the buildings and beautiful haciendas abandoned with it. Buenos dias, it's another wonderful day in Merida and it is a scorcher. Yeah, it's like 92 today. today. Oh my gosh, it is very warm. And this is in the middle of February where everyone else is covered in snow. We are sweating our butts off. I can't even imagine Merida in the worst months, April and May. Woo! But our first stop for today is coming to the extremely large market here, San Bernito Mercado. It is massive. It's massive and it's indoors, so hopefully we're going to be able to beat the heat a little bit while we're in here. Oh yeah. So the first thing we did, of course, when we got to the Mercado, walked straight to the food vendors. So we're gonna get some nachos with pastora. Excellent. We haven't had nachos very much throughout Mexico. It doesn't seem to be a super popular thing in the other states that we visited. But here in the Yucatan and the Quintana Roo, it seems to be quite popular. I don't know if that's just because of the sheer amount of expats. I definitely think nachos is more of a Tex-Mex kind of vibe. So I don't know if that's the inspiration here or if this is just the region it originated from. So if you know the answer, we'd love to hear more. Put it in the comments so that we can find out if nachos is totally a gringo thing or a Yucatecan thing. One thing we've noticed when we come to markets in Mexico is they're really organized. There's always the similar items being sold in one section. So all of the goods for sale will be in one area, same for the meats, vegetables, and of course it's true here for the food. So there's just a huge long strip of all of these vendors pretty much selling the exact same types of meats. So we always just look for the place that has the most people. It's typically a good indicator. If they're not screaming and like basically begging you to come to the shop and there's already a bunch of people sitting down, that's the one you should go with because usually that's the local favorite and it's not going to disappoint. We get asked all the time if you need to speak Spanish to come to Mexico. The more Spanish you know, the more it will help. And I definitely encourage you to try and learn as much Spanish as possible. I think it just enhances your experience tremendously. We just ended up passing a spice shop in the market and we saw an odd looking herb or flower and we asked him what it was. Supposedly it's called chupul. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But if children are having a hard time with pronunciation, they may have a speech impediment, or maybe they're not speaking at all, they believe here in the Yucatan that you can take this flower and you can spin it inside of the child's mouth nine times, and it's supposed to help them be able to speak. So we would have never learned little things like this if we didn't speak the language. So we definitely recommend trying as much as you can. There's lots of free resources to help you with your Spanish, and then just speaking when you're around people. It's okay if you sound silly, everyone's really friendly about speaking to you. You just kind of gotta let it go and give it a try. Merida is one of the safest cities, not just in all of Mexico, but actually in the entire world. And it's one of the reasons that expats love living here so much. Something I personally noticed that I'd say is different between other cities we visited in Mexico is just how clean, organized, and beautiful the city is. It parts and times, it feels like you're walking through a European city, not so much a city here in Mexico. And I think its scale, architecture, history, and design reminds us a lot of Mexico City, just a much smaller version. So we came to Santa Lucia Park. This is another little plaza that uh, has tons of restaurants on it and down the street is a gelato shop that has some really unique flavors like Parmesan cheese ice cream which sounds really weird but I'm sure it is tasty. We ended up going for flan de Cuba, Cubano I believe, and a cardamom ice cream. We're hoping this is going to pick us up because I'm not going to lie, both of us are a little grumpy and tired. I think it's from all the heat. It's just a lot for us. It's our first time in this heat for a while.
finished the evening off having an incredible meal at Micaela Mar Elena, a popular seafood restaurant serving craft cocktails and a great mezcal selection. Everything we got, including two types of carajillos, a regional drink from the Yucatan Peninsula made with liquor 43 and espresso, were super rico. Uh, I'm so excited. Yes, let's pay. A must when coming to the Yucatan is ordering marquesitas. It's kind of like a crepe. They take like a waffle filling and they put it on a really hot pan. Then they add cheese, which this is a dom cheese. It's called queso de bola. And they roll it. That's the traditional version, but you can also add all different flavors like cream cheese, strawberry, cajeta, Nutella. I just went for the traditional since it's my first time trying it, but this place is like popping. It's El Tony on the Paseo, and he's clearly loved by the locals. It's like, like been busy nonstop. I love a dom cheese. It's like a mix between Parmesan and a Gruyere. So it's got a little bit of funk with the Parmesan feel. These are awesome. I'm kind of mad that we hadn't tried them yet. If you're a Mexican national, you can skip this part of the video because you've done this before. If you're an American and you're intrigued by the Mexican healthcare system, follow us along as we get our teeth cleaned in Mexico. A lot of people come to Mexico to get their teeth done because the cost for medical care in general is significantly cheaper than you might find in the United States and can be a lot quicker than you might find in Canada. So today, we're getting our teeth cleaned. It's a really fancy office, definitely speak perfect English. And they gave us a mouth rinse to swish around and then we've just been in the sink before we can even see the dentist. It's hilarious that the office is now watching our channel. So right now would be a little reminder if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. We can officially check teeth cleaning dentist visit off of our Mexico bucket list. <laughs> it was very professional, clean, quick, and affordable. For the two of us to get our teeth cleaned, it costs around 80 US dollars, 1600 pesos. And I think this was like the higher end, nicer dentist because that that was a very luxurious office. Now, we're gonna show you a little bit more around Merida. Merida became Mexico's wealthiest city thanks to sisal, a fiber made from the leaves of agave plants that was used for rope and other fabrics. Mexico's sisal hacienda owners became millionaires, building massive French-inspired mansions along Paseo de Montejo. This tree-lined boulevard is inspired by the Champ Elise in Paris and is the perfect place to see Merida's former opulence in all its glory. If you'll be in Merida on the weekend, we definitely suggest walking or bicycling down the Paseo de Montejo. They close it down so it's pedestrian or bikes only, no cars are allowed. It's every Sunday from 9 to I believe 12 p.m. and it's a great way to get up close to some of the beautiful historic mansions. There's museums, restaurants, hotels, so you can also kind of walk in a few of them and see how grand and amazing some of these mansions would have been in their heyday. I mean, they're still grand and beautiful today, but imagine living in that. Like, imagine this being your home. being restored or being used as businesses today, including this one, which is Quinta Montes Molina, which is a house that has been well-preserved and now turned into a museum. So you can actually go inside and get a tour to see what it would have been like to live here. These buildings would have taken decades to build. They even brought materials over from Europe. They have real Carrera marble as the floors, and you can totally see the European influence in all of the mansions. The properties are spectacular. 85 pesos if you're interested in doing a tour. Unfortunately, we don't have time for this this go around, but it's definitely something we'll be visiting when we return to Merida in the future. In Merida, there is a huge cantina culture, and that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. It's kind of like Spain, where if you go in and you order a drink or enough drinks, they will give you free botanas, which are like tapas. But I'm excited because I'm hungry, and I could always go for a drink. 
Cantinas have been a part of life in Mexico for centuries. Originally a men's only bar, cantinas were a place where working men could gather, drink, and socialize in the centro, having access to cheap beer and snacks. Cantinas have come a long way, with most now allowing women these days. There are a wide variety of cantinas you can visit throughout Mexico, but particularly in Merida. Zalbai Cantina is not your everyday rowdy place. The owner, an expat musician who plays in the Yucatan Orchestra, wanted to create a laid-back hub for art, culture, and music, particularly jazz, blues, and R&B. We are musicians and artists, and so all the art we have in the bar is for sale, and it's from Cuba and Russia and the United States, all local artists from elsewhere who live here now selling their art, and we have live music from all, all sides of the world playing here every single night at 7 o'clock. After having a fantastic time in Merida with our friends, we headed to the small beach town of Cisal, about an hour and a half to two hours drive north. This is one of the newest Pueblo Mexicos in the Yucatan, and it's often less crowded and a little bit less touristy than nearby Progreso or the popular Rio Lagartos. Both of those are fantastic trips for Merida and well worth your time if you are doing a road trip here. But we're ready to take in the slow-paced vibes of Cisal. Today we're going on an exciting adventure. We are gonna go for a kayak trip through the mangroves, out to Bird Island. This beautiful estuary is supplied with a constant flow of fresh water from nearby cenotes, but lies roughly three feet below sea level. This allows salt water from the neighboring ocean to seep in, creating a perfectly brackish sanctuary for fish, birds, and even crocodiles. The crystal clear water has a deep red hue from the red mangroves that surround it. Normally you can find just a few inches to a foot of water, but due to heavy rains this summer and fall, most places in the estuary were under two to three feet or more. Cisal is located near the Salastun biosphere, which is home to hundreds of different species of native and migratory birds, including frigates, flamingos, white pelicans, roseate spoonbills, red herons, cormorants, and many others. Normally, each migratory bird nests and lives among the same species, but for some unknown reason, the bird island here in Cisal has several species living together in this one island. This is one of the only places on Earth that this happens and is studied heavily by scientists and ornithologists. So many types of birds here. We've seen a lot of roseate spoonbills. I keep thinking they're flamingos. Not yet. Our guide, JC, who has been amazing, he says it's a little high of tide right now. The water's just too high. Flamingos like to be in a, a smaller amount of water, so it's pretty unlikely that we'll, we'll see them today. The kayak trip was awesome. We really enjoyed getting to see Bird Island. I had no idea how much uh, seeing all different types of birds I'm not familiar with would make me into like kind of like a birder. But it was definitely a really cool experience if you're coming to Cecil, we definitely recommend it. Today I ventured into town with Greg, kind of got to explore a little bit of downtown Cecil, which is definitely growing you can see they're making major improvements and it's just a quaint little fishing town we ended up going to a fish cooperative where we were able to pick up some yellowtail fish for fish tacos tonight it was as fresh as it gets they had just gotten the fish off the boat and they were weighing them so that's going to be a delicious meal you don't need the cold or a snowy mountain road to be in paradise don't need diamonds of gold 
all the pictures we've been so paradise it's a simple state of mind it's the people by your side but only you can find paradise Spoiled now. We had water, we had dump, we had electricity, 30 amp service electricity, which is out of control. And now you're releasing us back into the Mexican wild. And we're not sure what we're gonna do with ourselves. <laughs> One thing Cecil definitely needs to figure out for those that want to come in the RV is where RVers can camp. Right now they're still growing so much. There's hotels, like Airbnb kind of things. You can stay at little um, cute casitas on the water and stuff. But right now there's, there's no RV park, so. You'll have to maybe come from a day trip from Merida. From Cisau, we began our three hour drive to the city of Valladolid. We just got to our spot here in Valladolid. It's a super unique campground that is also a bee museum and you can actually take free tours as a part of staying here. There's also cabanas, they have a restaurant with like a food truck that sells pizza each night. There's hammocks all around, a beautiful pool, there's hot showers, bathroom, a little kitchen area, they have wi-fi, and the electricity is super solid. They do have water here but the only thing they are missing is a dump. So we plan to use the showers and the bathrooms here, do minimal cooking inside the RV and we can dump when we get to another location if needed. We're planning to spend a whole week here in Vitaly because there's a lot to do. Not only is there a super cute historic downtown but there's tons of cenotes in the area as well as two ruins, one you've probably heard of, Chichen Itza. So we plan to have this be our base to explore the general area in and around Valladolid. One of the things I love about coming to markets like this is you get a really authentic experience for what shopping here and eating here is like. Not only is there a whole area for the vegetables, but they also have prepared foods, they have all of the meats, fish. It's just such a fun experience. We ended up passing a stall that had something we've never seen before, so of course we asked. They're called polcancitos, and it's going to be maize that they fry, filled with a little bit of fried potato and frijol beans. They're like, so nice and warm and crispy, I can't wait to try them. Interesting. <laughs> Not the best street food I've ever had, or market food, but it's good. Something new. You love trying new things. That was fun. <laughs> now I need to try some fruits of my labors. I get paid. Mm. So good. I love Teacher Rome. This is so fresh, like it's still warm. And I have a big hunk of meat, the belly meat. One of the two, oh my God. Our amigo at the Teacher Rome stall told us we have to come across the way and get some mondongo, which is a beef broth soup that they serve traditionally for breakfast time. I'm sure this is gonna be delicious. It smells really beefy though, and the meat in it is definitely all tripa, stripes with stomach of the cow, yeah. All right, here we go, I'm trying to broth. It's a little gamey for my, for my flavor, but it's very nice, very warming, very rich. Would it be something that I would eat every morning? Absolutely no. not. Our Chicharron friends also recommended that we come to this stall. And we got something that's typical for Valladolid for this region, which is called lomitas, which is puerco or pork with tomato, and then they have an egg. 
Mm. Since I'm not, I don't eat meat really. I'm not used to the flavor. Cochinita is one of the only ones I can really like. Doesn't feel super meaty or greasy to me. This tastes like meat, so it's not my favorite. But I think if you love meat, you would love this. morning we woke up early so that we could catch the bee tour that's at our trailer park and hotel. They actually work with Mayan bees which is a special type of bee in this area. I'm really excited to learn about them. In the Yucatan there are over 46 different species of melipona and Scopec is a sanctuary to four of the 46 species of these Mayan bees which have built hives in and around their dry cenote. Unlike the well-known European honeybee, meliponas are very small, solid black, and often mistaken for flies. Meliponas have called the Yucatan home for eons and played an integral role in Mayan civilizations, influencing the worship of gods directly related to these bees. Unlike the European honeybee, meliponas are stingless, with each species having a unique hive construction and process of producing honey. Some hang their hives from the cave's ceiling, creating a stalactite-like shape, while others live in hollow logs or burrow underground. Because of their size, meliponas produce a very small amount of honey, roughly one, maybe two liters of honey per hive per year. Almost nothing compared to the 70 liters a typical European beehive produces. It's also extremely difficult to access melipona honey. The beekeepers must use syringes to extract the honey from each sack, a process that must be performed with extreme care to not destroy the entire hive. At the end of our tour, we enjoyed a tasting, including crystallized honey made by European bees with pollen from local flowers of the Valladolid region, and medicinal tinctures which use the melipona honey for soothing cataracts and curing respiratory infections. Y'all, the bee tour was absolutely amazing. If you're coming to Via the Lead, this is a must do. Our first stop for our cenote tour today was coming to Cenote Samula. It was 80 pesos for one cenote, but there's actually two on site, so you can pay 125 to have access to both. And you have to rent chalecas or life jackets to actually access the water. They don't allow you in it without, which was another 20 pesos. They do have lockers here as well. But these cenotes are different from any cenote we visited in the past because they are underground. So I guess there's like a life cycle of cenotes, but all of them start underground in more of like a cave. And then eventually over time, the limestone above wears away and it becomes an open cenote where it's partially exposed at least. So this is a super cool experience. That was super rad. Kind of bummed that we weren't here a little earlier because the hole in the roof, um, if you get here midday, I guess anytime between like 11 and three, there's a beam of light that comes shooting down, that lights up the whole cave. So kind of bummed we didn't get to see that, but Liz was kind of uh, asking me like, why are you only staying in one spot the whole time? I was looking up out of the hole in the roof of the cave and I noticed there was an owl like hanging out, cleaning itself on one of the ledges. So I was just like, mesmerized by that. There are literally thousands. I think there's an estimated 5,000 cenotes in the Yucatan Peninsula. And Valladolid has a large concentration right around the surrounding area. So within a 15 minute drive, pretty much you can get to several different cenotes. So if you're on a, the hunt for cenote adventures, this is definitely a good area to stop off and try to explore a few of the different varieties. You have to rent a life jacket at each cenote location.
super rad but in a totally different way than the first one that we visited. The rock formations inside of this one were way more elaborate than the other one. I didn't go into this cenotes because unfortunately at the last cenote, I left our backpack unattended to take some pictures of Dennis. And then of course, when I went swimming, I kind of tucked it away, but someone ended up going into our wallet and taking some money. A thousand pesos, which is about 50 US dollars. It's a big bummer. It's the first time in all of our eight months in Mexico something like this happened. But that could happen absolutely anywhere, on the beach in Miami, on the beach in St. Pete. It could have been way worse. My phone was in the backpack and all kinds of other things. So if they wanted to take the whole backpack, they could have done it. But at the same time, they didn't. We only lost 50 bucks. Stupid ass mistake. We'll never make it again. We'll rent a locker. So we decided to venture into the city center of Valladolid to not just go to the famous Zaki Cenote that is literally in the center of town, but also to kind of get a taste for what Valladolid is like. Not surprisingly, it's another beautiful colonial city filled with bright, colorful buildings, a lot of Spanish architecture, a beautiful plaza in the center that has all of these fun white benches to sit on, but I'm not going to lie. The cold front that came through is long gone and it is steamy and it is hot here. I totally get why there's so many cenotes and that's like a thing to do because you have to find a way to beat this heat. Inside of the park there's tons of different little vendor stalls selling ice creams like slushies, snacks. It has a nice vibe to it for sure. There's lots of people here just hanging out trying to find shade in this heat. First impression, so amazing. The waterfall is such a great touch and it's only 30 pesos to get into this. There's definitely a lot of people here, but it doesn't feel like it's overcrowded and today is a super hot day. Plus it's a weekend, so not too bad. I'm ready to jump in. There's like a bunch of different levels you can jump off of. You can jump. I'm not jumping, I'm not a jumper. Very, very fun. I think that might be the tallest one I've done so far. But the water feels so refreshing.
not get enough of the colors in these old Spanish colonial towns here in Mexico. They're beautiful. Every single building's painted a different color. It's just so fun. Cenotezaki was awesome. Definitely recommend, especially if you only have a limited amount of time, we probably would just say ditch the other cenotes, the, the, the double ones we went to, and just come here. But I think right now, our best bet is to get some grub and to get some beer. There's actually craft beer here in Vitalid, so you know we never pass up craft beer. We ended up coming to Idilio, which is a restaurant that is really, really, really cute. They have a great outdoor dining area. Of course, they have craft beer to try, and their menu sounded delicious. But this entire street, I think it's been the Street of the Friars, it has like so many cute shops on it. It's tons of restaurants, tons of cute little boutiques. So if you're looking to shop or if you're looking for a little bit of fine dining or creative menus, I definitely think this is a street to give a try. It's good. It's like a hoppy cream ale. Really good. Really good. We're super excited because we're about to eat Cochinita P. Beal at one of the top 20 restaurants in the world at Chef Rosalia Chai's house. This is like, I got goosebumps. That's how cool this is gonna be. Coming here is a true experience. We're gonna be here for about two and a half hours, and not only do we get to eat cochinita pibil and relleno negro, among a few other dishes, but we also get to participate in the making of the tortillas. We get to watch her uncover the cochinita from the pib. If you're staying in Valle de Lead, you're gonna have to drive an hour to Yakshuna, which is a super tiny Mayan Pueblo. There's not even cell service, but there are a lot of cool things to do, including an archeological zone and a cenote that we'll be checking out after dinner when we're super full from all the cochinita. So definitely prepare for this, making reservations online. Since they don't have internet here, they don't actually coordinate the reservations, but she does have a website where you can actually um, pay for the reservations and booking beforehand. It's only 70 US dollars per person to dine here, which if you consider the quality of the food that you're getting and the experience as a whole, that's a steal. Cochinita Pibil, as we know it today, became the traditional dish of the Yucatan after the Spanish arrived in the 1500s. The Mayans who used a pib or underground oven to cook many varieties of food for centuries prior created the dish using new ingredients imported to the area by the Spanish. Chef Rosalia Chai makes the most authentic cochinita pibil possible, using a special type of black hairless pig called Cerro Pelón Mexicano, cooking the meat up to eight hours in the underground pib. Rosalia's masterful skill and love of her craft, a tradition that was passed down to her by her mother, is what elevates her cochinita above others you may try elsewhere in Mexico. Nearly all the ingredients used to make her cochinita pibil and relleno negro are grown in Chef Rosalia's backyard, including sour oranges and achiotes, which give the ricotto rojo its deep red color. Her kitchen is completely outdoors, employing only the most traditional tools to cook each meal. Wood fires, underground pibs, matates for grinding, and comals for baking tortillas. Her sister assists with preparing fresh tortillas by hand each day, a tremendous responsibility considering the average Mayan eats eight to 10 tortillas with each meal, roughly 30 per day. Making tortillas, man. <laughs> the traditional Mayan way, no press. To prepare the cochinita pibil and relleno negro, Chef Rosalia makes a recado, a paste of spices and herbs on her matate, a stone grinder traditionally used by the Mayans and other ancient Mesoamerican corn cultures. In the Yucatan, the three most famous recados are negro, which is used for the relleno negro, rojo, which is used for the cochinita pibil, and recado blanco, which is the base for all other recados. Cochinita pibil is a dish reserved for special occasions like weddings, big birthdays, or religious celebrations. The pib used to cook cochinita pibil is traditionally used only once. However, because of the number of guests she receives, Chef Rosalia uses her pibs for about a month before constructing a new one. Our first dish was tamales coladas, a special tamal made with lard, maize, tomato, chicken, and a sauce from the achiote seeds. 
The tamal is wrapped in a banana leaf, then steamed, keeping the maiz moist and combining all of the beautiful flavors. Oh, it's super flavorful. Oh, it has a little spice. <laughs> and I love how it's not so dry. Like the moistness, I hate that word, but the moistness is really good. I'm so excited, like I'm so excited. Mm. Oh my god. This is so good. Wow, the texture of the pork is so soft and smooth and tender. To finish the entire experience and meal off, we are going to be drinking Stabentun, which is a liquor that is made with anise and miel, honey. Salud. Oh, it's quite lovely. I normally hate anise. Like really just do not like it. This is quite lovely. Definitely has strong anise flavors, but the honey from it really balances out. Absolutely incredible. Mind blowing. Just such a unique experience to not just get to eat the most amazing meat in Cochinita and Reino Negro we've ever had, but to also get to know more about her story, to see how she cooks it, to get to meet her. I mean, just the chef, Chef Rosalia, is part of the experience in itself. But now that we're full and very happy, we're gonna go jump in a very cool and refreshing cenote. We didn't know that this one was here until we got to Rosalia's place. The one we were expecting to visit today was actually Il Kiel, which is all over Instagram and the internet in general. It's super famous, but we're glad we didn't end up going there because we talked to some people that we met at Lol Ha today, and they said it's a very similar experience to the cenotes we visited and by the lead. So we have to wear a life jacket. It's super touristic. It's very, very developed tons of people visiting from Chichen Itza. This one on the other hand, very private, very rustic. No one was there bothering us. They had life jackets available, but it wasn't required. It's just a much nicer experience all around. <laughs> On our way out, we decided to stop by the archaeological zone. You don't need that anymore, do uh, you? That's true. <laughs> Which is called Ja Shuna, uh -huh. and it means the first house. house. Yes, La Primera Casa. And it actually connected to the great city of Coba, which is a popular archaeological zone that you can go to that's not too far from Tulum. It's about halfway between here. There's actually a long white road that's supposed to connect all the way 100 kilometers from the ruins of Coba to here because this was, um, I guess, like, like a, a satellite city. Yeah, that was yeah. important to the great city of Coba. So we're just gonna see what there is to see here. We're not paying for a guide or anything. It's only an hour before closing. It's typically 100 pesos per person when we came to visit the archaeological zone. And then if you wanted to hire a guide to learn more about the history and, and the site itself, it's that's separate. Yeah. yeah. The Mayans sure knew how to pick a location. It's beautiful up here. The trees kind of feel like it's a little bit of like the African Serengeti, but all of the green lushness 
and the yellow flowers, it's so beautiful. We're the only people here. No vendors, no nothing. Yeah. Just us, the bees, the birds, and the pyramids. It's a pretty great way to explore an archaeological zone. Yeah. If we could have got a guide, that would have been like cherry on top. Yeah, because we don't really know what we're looking at, really. No. I mean, they do have signs for a few things, but they don't actually explain anything about it. It's right. just telling you what the building was probably used for. Right. This feels like some Indiana Jones crazy. Mosquito game is strong here. We're at the top of the Temple Mayor, which is this giant hill that we saw from the other biggest temple that's over here but it's completely unexcavated. I'm sure if they excavated this thing, it would be absolutely stunning. But for now, we just get to enjoy the views from at the top. The sun's about to set and you can see the whole area from up here, at least through the trees. Buenos dias. Today we ventured out to Chichen Itza. This has definitely been on our bucket list. It's one of the most famous archaeological sites. It's probably the pyramid that you think of when you see or hear about the Riviera Maya or the Yucatan Peninsula. And because of it, it's really expensive. Like shockingly expensive compared to other pyramid sites. It was 80 pesos to park our scooter in the parking lot and then it was 533 pesos per person. If you want to film with our GoPro, it's 45 pesos extra. They took our microphone and made us keep it behind the door, the gate, when they saw it. So if our audio sucks right now, I'm really sorry. And then if you want a guide to be able to actually get familiar with the area, learn a little bit more about the Mayan culture, what happened here, important sites, that's going to be another thousand pesos. Chichen Itza was an important Mayan city believed to have had as many as 35,000 residents at its peak. Like other Mayan sites in the area, the city had several important buildings, including a market where goods were traded, residences, two different cenotes, a ball court, and several temples used for various religious and political purposes. After the Spanish arrived, Chichen Itza was abandoned, later rediscovered and reconstructed by the Carnegie Institution, starting in 1925. El Castillo, the city's most iconic temple, has 91 stairs and 365 steps, said to represent the days of the solar year. If you come to Chichen Itza on the spring or fall solstice, the sun aligns with the temple, creating a serpent-like shadow on the stairwell, something thousands of people come each year to witness. The Mayan ball game Tlachli wasn't played for fun, but rather for ceremonial reasons. The game was intense, lasting sometimes several days and required the teams to score points by hitting a large leather ball through a hoop without using their head, hands, or feet. Along the ball court walls, hieroglyphics and inscriptions can be seen representing life at this time, including scenes of Tlachli players losing their heads. Throughout the city, there are carvings of skulls and warriors which were used as an intimidation tactic for visitors from subordinate villages and also to document significant occurrences and beliefs of the time. Sacrifices were a common practice for the Mayan people, and most offerings were placed on demigod statues now called medium men. These messengers to the gods can be found in several locations around Chichen Itza, including the Temple of Warriors, where it is believed the beating hearts of enemies were offered after a successful battle. 
There are two cenotes here at Chichen Itza. The one behind me is called the Sacred Cenote. And it's believed that the Mayans actually used the cenote for sacrificial offerings to the god of the underworld. There was actually nine gods that they believed lived in the underworld, and this was one of the ways to access or connect with them. The person that discovered the cenote back in 1901 that explored this area ended up finding things like turquoise, jade, gold, silver, especially a lot of jewelry at the bottom, as well as human remains from children, which they believed they were sacrificing younger children after giving them an herbal drink that would kind of be like medicinal mushrooms, I guess you could say, but to help them connect with the spirits. So this was a very important area for the Mayan culture. They believed that the sacrifice of these children could help bring things like water or a good harvest. It was definitely done with intention and with purpose. It was never done just out of ill will. It is very warm here, so if you're coming, a little tip, make sure you bring water, have a hat, have sunscreen so that you don't get burnt, <laughs> because it's pretty much out in the open. There's also tons of little vendors and stalls selling all different things for you to take home. So Eagle Scale of Coolness, what's your consensus? I'd give it a five because it has a lot of features that none of the other archaeological sites have. And yes, a lot of them are restored, so they're not original, but they're still here. So it's still rad to see what it would have looked like when it was still in use. And there are enough buildings and grounds for you to feel like you've really, really explored. But because of the price, I'm going to give it four eagles. Just because if you can prove this to Teotihuacan, which costs 80 pesos per person, it just seems like they know that they have a ton of tourists coming from the Cancun, Tulum region and they charge for it and that's kind of disappointing. Super glad we came, glad we paid, but I think you can still get really cool experiences elsewhere if you have a chance to visit other pyramids as well. For cheap. We got back to the scooter. Then we'll start. I did something weird the other day where it flashed uh, a light on the dash that's supposed to indicate that the FA battery is dying. From the help from the taxi drivers, they first tested our battery to see if it was the actual battery by jumping it, but nothing even happened. So then we realized it was definitely the key fob. Luckily, they called one of their friends. The friends brought over a few of the batteries that fit in key fobs. Unfortunately, it wasn't the right size. So one of the guys actually took out the battery from his key fob for his motorcycle at his house and gave it to us. We, we paid for it, of course. We tipped them nicely, but we're back on the road. Dude, Stressful. it's always an adventure on the X-Max. We had a long day at the pyramid and dealing with the scooter problems and a 45 minute ride home. So we didn't want to cook. So we got pizza and french fries. Yeah. Just as we were preparing to go to bed, Dennis looked over by my pillow and there's a scorpion. What? What do we do? Floridians are not used to scorpions. I didn't even know there were scorpions in the Yucatan. I'm just glad they did not sting our cats. Like, how did it get in? And is there more behind the wall? Like, go in the jar. Okay. Okay, it's in the jar. It's in the jar. And it's pissed. <laughs> You're very good, though. Uh, check him out. Whoa. We just got a new pet. Ready? Let's do this. Our next stop is the world famous Cancun. We typically like to shy away from super touristic spots like this, but after a surprise visit to the hospital for Dennis, we decided to explore a bit after he recovered. We've been drinking so much water with him not feeling well. I'm just trying to stay hydrated as well. We decided to come fill up at the Purificada. If you've been to Cancun in the hotel zone before, you probably know how touristy it is. It 
feels just like pretty much any beach town in Florida. Big built up hotels and condos, big streets, lots of shopping centers, chain restaurants. It's not exactly an authentic representation of Mexico, but there are little hidden gems throughout the hotel zone and in Cancun that might surprise you. We ended up coming to El Galeón del Caribe, which is this little off the cut in the road restaurant. There's just a hut on the inland side by the canal. We've heard they have great fish tacos at normal Mexico prices, not the built up touristy prices of the hotel zone you might be used to. So we're gonna give it a try. Definitely not what I was expecting when I heard fish tacos, but they're very good. This place is super cute. It's right on the intercoastal. They get fresh food every single day. And the food is definitely well priced. Tacos are $20. We even got a shrimp dish with ajo, which is one of our favorites. It's definitely recommended. It'll get you off the beaten path for Cancun. The food's delicious, the prices are right, and the ambiance is on point. Yeehaw. I've never seen ocean water with a color like this. Yes, holy moly. The water here is so beautiful. It is such a striking turquoise blue. We've heard that Cancun has some of the best beaches in all of Mexico, and I, I get it. I get it now. But we did not come on the most optimal days. You can see there's a red flag behind me because it's super windy. And yesterday a cold front came through, so honestly, it's a little bit chilly. I'm in my bathing suit just because I'm at the beach. It's like feels wrong not to be, but I'm still loving it. Although I will not go in the water. Look at those waves. Yeah. I'm hoping tomorrow will be a little bit more calm. This, this is gorgeous. That's all I can handle right now. I'm feeling a little tired. Probably be starting to ache a little bit. Probably shouldn't have ate a bunch of greasy fried tacos. My first meal out. Buenos dias. It's a new day. We're at a new beach. Decided to come to a different public beach. There's actually like six or seven different public beach accesses despite all of the hotels on here, that's something I really like about Cancun. And all of them have palapas that you can hang out under, so you have free shade, you don't have to pay for parking. It's really nice. The sun's out, feels good. Shower, refreshing up a little bit from a fun beach day. We're going to treat ourselves to a nice fish seafood dinner on the beach. This restaurant is super famous. It's called Marabella's Fish Market. They actually sell fish here, but of course they have a restaurant with it. So this has come highly recommended. It has thousands of reviews on Google, which tells you something. So we're looking forward to a sunset dinner here. The entrance is kind of tricky. It's just in a random building that looks like it's like an Aberrante store but you have to go upstairs. Last night 
night's dinner was incredible. A little bit expensive, but definitely a worth it dining experience outside of the hotel zone. It, it was awesome. But this campground was 300 pesos for the two of us. There was electricity. They also had water and dumps here and the Wi-Fi was really, really great. There's a pyramid that is directly next to our RV campground, which we didn't get to explore right now. It's called Mecco Pyramid. I definitely think it's worth a stopover. It, it's a small site, but it's a pretty significant building in good condition. And I guess it used to be a huge trading port for this area. And then of course you can always do a day trip or a few days in Isla Mujeres. We're off. We made it to the ferry to go to Isla Mujeres, which is Ultramar Carga. We were actually able to take our scooter with us today, but we made it here with like two minutes to spare. The line to get the tickets took forever. And if you've been watching our vlog for a while, you know that we're not exactly the best on timing. We woke up two hours early for this and we still just made it by the skin of our teeth. Nah, man, we're late for everything. So the tickets to come here one way with the scooter because we're non-residents was 295 pesos. So we have to buy tickets to return back on the ferry later this evening. And if you are planning to come to Isla Mujeres when you visit Cancun, you definitely wanna make sure you're checking the ferry times on Facebook or actually go to the box office where you buy the tickets because the website's times are often Don't wrong. Don't trust the website ever. And there's ever. signs all over that says like every 18 minutes you can just go to Isla Mujeres. It's just not true. So there's two ferries today to go to Isla Mujeres and I think three or four returning. So we're gonna spend the day there. dropped us off on the north tip of the island and our mission right now is to get some breakfast. We were hoping to get Cochina de Pibil when we were in town before the ferry but as you know timing did not allow for that but luckily they have their own little town center on the north side of the island so I think we found some street food that we're gonna hopefully maybe have Cochina de Pibil. If not we'll find something delicious. So there's like two Cochinita places right across from each other. Tacos are only 15 pesos so we're gonna get a taco from each and then decide which one we're gonna get a torture from. Oh, baby. <laughs> mm. Round two. This is very good. In different ways, but I think I prefer the other one actually. This is really good though. I personally chose tacos de canasta. I got papa con queso. And then I think I also got a free hole. We always suggest finding street vendors to try local food at. This is the way that people in Mexico prefer to eat most of the time. Restaurants, especially for breakfast, aren't super popular. Most of the time you grab a gordito, a taco, a torta, and that's what you would enjoy for breakfast. And we definitely recommend trying to find these little places whenever you're traveling through Mexico. I think it's a much more authentic experience. You get to try some really delicious food and it's super affordable. We made it to North Beach. This is a beautiful beach if you're trying to spend the day out in the sun. There's tons of boats stocked offshore. There's restaurants you can grab a drink or a snack at or a meal at. And the sand is so, so soft. Right now we're here, it's like a really overcast day, which is kind of a bummer, just because you can tell if the sun was out, the water would be 10 times more brilliant than it is right now. But it's still a beautiful day to be at a beach. Wow, 
We have a new baby coming into the family. Un, un regalo. We don't typically buy souvenirs when we're out and about, but our trip is slowly coming to an end, so if we see something that looks we're unique, excuses now. <laughs> if we see something that looks unique and special to that place, we've learned when you're in Mexico, buy it. Yes. Because most of the time, you're never going to be able to find that exact one again. And that's with anything, like literally anything, because all of it's usually handmade. So you might be able to find something kind of similar, but if you see something truly badass that you think I should buy that, you need to pull the trigger. Also, be prepared for everyone to try and get you to come to the vendor stall. It's just a part of culture in Mexico. They're gonna say, come, come, hello, welcome, please come into my stall, bienvenidos, pasale, pasale. Look at all of the things that I have. You just say gracias and keep walking if you're not interested. Yeah, that's it can, totally not rude. It can put people off at first if you're not used to this. It's not something that they do really in Canada or very much in Europe or in the US, in the US at all. So it can be a little off-putting, but it's just part of life here. So the most popular way to get around Isla Mujeres after you get off the ferry is to rent a golf cart. We've seen people get charged up to 1,200 pesos for a day rental for a golf cart, but right now because of COVID and the decrease in tourism on the island, they're only renting them for like 800 pesos for a day of rental. So come to Isla Mujeres, rent a golf cart, and have a bunch of fun. We made it to the southernmost point of Isla Mujeres, which is a popular stop-off point. You have beautiful views of the ocean all around, but it's also an archaeological site. It's a small pyramid, it's not much to it, but its significance for the island and its creation story is pretty spectacular. It's 30 paces to get in if you're interested in checking it out. I'm like listening, there's a tour guide over there. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> we did our research before coming to Isla Mujeres. The island was originally inhabited by the Mayans, serving as a sanctuary for their goddess Ixchel, protector of the moon, fertility, medicine, and happiness. Her temple, which also served as a torch-lit lighthouse, can still be seen at Punta Sur today. When the Spanish arrived in the 1500s, it's believed the only inhabitants of the island were priestesses of Ixchel, and there were statues of the goddess all over the island. Hence the name Isla Mujeres, meaning Island of Women. The weather today is crazy. The waves are roaring. It feels more like we're like in Ireland. Well, it's not cold, so I guess we have that. But just the way it's crashing against the rocks and the bright color of the water, it reminds me of what I've seen of Ireland. We'll go there eventually. But if you are coming, I definitely recommend this. 30 pesos really honestly is really affordable. And to kind of learn about the history and see the original lighthouse is really cool. But in addition, you get to walk all the way down right next to the ocean. There's like a, a cool path that goes down from the archeological zone that's really unique. Ocean got me. Rogue wave, rogue wave. That was wild. Not expecting that at all. I'm glad it didn't wasn't any bigger because it probably would have knocked me over. This is one of the things I love about Mexico, and I'm starting to realize that I dislike very much about everywhere else. If you fall in here, you can pretty much guarantee like you're either gonna be really hurt or you're gonna die. And no one's gonna come to save you because there's no like emergency button down here anywhere. There's no guardrail, 
messing up this amazingly dangerous view. I love it, man. Oh, 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 oh. This is the view from the cliff of the Don. This is the easternmost point in the entire country of Mexico. So if you come here early enough in the morning, right at sunrise, then you can be the first one in Mexico to get touched by the sun. Super rad. We made it back to the north side of town because it's almost time for us to catch our ferry. We're gonna grab some food, but I wanted to mention that if you're coming to Isla Mujeres, definitely make time to snorkel or dive. Obviously with our limited time here being just a day, we knew that wasn't in the cards. Also, the weather wasn't exactly great, but Isla Mujeres has some incredible spots to explore underwater, including an underwater museum that has over 500 statues, which was built in 2010 to divert a lot of the tourists that were visiting the reefs. There's hundreds of thousands of tourists coming here and snorkeling or diving in these reefs every year, which is awesome, but it also does a lot of damage. It's kind of divert some of that traffic. They built this underwater museum that's now become its own unique coral reef to explore. And if you're coming through March through October, you can actually see the whale sharks pass through this area. They, there's hundreds of them that migrate through and around Isla Mujeres during this time, and you can actually take a boat out there and swim with them. Tim and Finn, who are a fellow American travel vloggers, they've spent a significant time in Mexico and were able to experience that during their stay in Isla Mujeres. So if you're interested in any of the underwater activities, definitely check out their videos. We're gonna grab some grub. We came to Tacos de Humo, which we're gonna get camarones, tacos de pescado, eat some crazy guacamole del chef, which they add mango and chilies to. So this is gonna be delicious. Hopefully this will be the cherry on top of a great day in Isla Mujeres. We're at a reusable straws. Mm. Cheers. Just like that, we're back where we started. It was a really fun day in Isla Mujeres. It's definitely a worthwhile visit. I could spend a whole week here. There's so many activities to do and explore on this island. You need more than one day to do it all. Like, you'll do one day of just activities on the island, going to see the lighthouse, and just exploring. But then if you actually want to go out and dive trips, you're gonna need a whole nother day or a couple of days to do all of that. Luckily, there's lots of hotels, Airbnbs. I think this is a great option if you're looking for somewhere other than Cancun. Speaking of beautiful islands and unique day trips from Cancun, our next stop is Cozumel, where we met up with my family for a New Year's vacation. Cozumel is one of the most famous islands off the shores of the Riviera Maya, and it's just a short ferry ride from Playa del Carmen. We're not going to explore the island, which is kind of touristy and not really our vibe. We're going to be doing a different exploration, snorkeling the second largest coral reef behind the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and going to a very special little island area called El Cielo. We ended up booking a tour with a booking company in Playa del Carmen. Robert Playa Tours, the best. We got a great price for each of us and we hopped on the ferry. They purchased our tickets for us. It was about a 45 minute ferry ride. And now we're on the Cosmo side. We we're about to hop on a smaller lancha to explore the area.
tips if you are going to come definitely make sure that you come early to board the ferry because the line is crazy long normally there's a ferry to Cozumel that you can just board and pay your traditional fee and then a tax for visiting the island which is not included in the actual tour price but we waited in line for a solid 45 minutes before being able to board and if you wait too late there's gonna be no no seats so Our Riviera Maya road trip continued as we drove an hour south of Playa del Carmen to Tulum. Known for its beautiful beaches and epic nightlife, Tulum is now one of the hottest spots in Mexico. Today we are heading to the archaeological zone in Tulum. It's one of the most popular activities to do. Tulum Ruins is one of the smaller archaeological zones found in the Yucatan Peninsula and the only remaining Mayan city built directly on the ocean. It's a young city compared to other Mayan ruins, dating back to only 560 AD. Tulum was a significant port of trade for the Mayans and is protected by three inland walls and a high cliff overlooking the sea. The site has buildings dedicated to the worship of different Mayan gods with pictograph effigies and murals that can still be clearly seen today. Tulum also had its own fresh water source, a now dry cenote that would have played a crucial part in helping the city thrive until it was abandoned during the Spanish conquest in the 1800s. If you don't like iguanas, I highly suggest staying away from Tulum ruins. We just witnessed an iguana fight. It was intense. Normally, you would be able to go down those stairs and access the beach and have access to this beautiful water. But unfortunately, today it's super windy, so they've closed the beach. Actually, both times we came here, the beach was closed. But 80 pesos to be able to go to the beach, since there's not a ton of public beaches here in Tulum, is a really good steal. When you get to the top, this is where the Instagram photo of Tulum ruins overlooking the gorgeous crystal clear turquoise water. If you're coming to Tulum, we definitely suggest coming to these ruins. It's 80 pesos per person to uh, get into the entrance. If you want to film, it's 45 pesos extra. And if you're really trying to dive deep into the history of these beautiful ruins, we definitely suggest taking a guide. You can hire a guide right at the entrance. Come early. This is definitely a popular activity to do in Tulum. Another super popular activity to do in Tulum is visit the cenotes. Tulum has several right in its immediate area. We've gone to Grand Cenote, which is arguably the most famous. It's also the most expensive and most visited. <laughs> it's 300 pesos per person, and it's really unique. It's that gorgeous clear water. There's like turtles swimming by, fish, and then it even has the stalactites and a little bit of a cave system for you to kind of explore. And today, we decided to come to Skull, cenote which is cenote calavera this one was 250 pesos per person and it has a really unique way to enter
it's definitely worth a stop. It's not ultra expensive. And as long as it's not crowded, it's totally chill. You can jump through the holes. It's clear. There's bats on the roof. It's, it's a rad spot. Another cenote you might want to check out is Cenote Azul. It's about a 45 minute drive from here. It's uh, closer to Puerto Aventuras, but it's only 120 pesos to get into that one. And it is wide open, completely different from Grand Cenote or Cenote Calavera. We got all dolled up to come into the hotel zone for a nice little like dinner out, treat ourselves to a more expensive meal. We wanted to come to the hotel bar Quinto. It's on top of the most famous and most expensive hotel in all of Tulum. It's gorgeous, but we ended up getting in line and it's 600 pesos for a drink per person. So it's 30 US dollars for us to just go upstairs and grab a drink. I do get that it's super unique and a great place to grab a drink for sunset, but 30 that's like New York City prices. It's bonkers. So we're gonna try and find a different bar. If you're coming here and budget's not really a concern, it's a unique place for sure to enjoy a drink. We've heard the food isn't that great, so definitely go elsewhere. hotel zone is wild. There's traffic everywhere. There's almost zero parking. So unfortunately we didn't make it to the bar with the rooftop view of the sunset that we wanted to, but it's called Rosa Negra. If you're looking to come, it's a beautiful bar on the bottom and then they do have a little section you can enjoy a drink on top. Last night was definitely interesting. The hotel zone is completely different from the Pueblo of Tulum. Came back today by myself, unfortunately. Dennis is not feeling too well, and it's just such a beautiful day out. I definitely wanted to just take in all of the views, the vibes, definitely do some people watching. is probably the best side of Tulum. The hotel zone where you can actually access all the bars and shops walking down that street is honestly a little chaotic. It's a very narrow street and there's really no sidewalks. So there's people on bikes, on motorcycles, the cars are passing and people are trying to walk. So it's really hard to kind of take in the vibes like we personally want to. Walking along the beach is a completely different feeling. It's so beautiful. I love being able to see all of the hotels and beach clubs, which by the way, if you're coming here, a few things you might wanna know about coming to the beach. If you're not staying in a hotel and you want to enjoy the beach here in Tulum, the best bet is to go to a beach club. Now, normally a beach club has a charge for the entrance fee, so you might pay anywhere from 200 to 500 pesos, potentially more if it's a higher end beach club, but that typically goes toward anything that you purchase at the beach club that day. You'll definitely spending to enjoy, but you get to take advantage of any umbrellas that they have, if they have palapas or lounge chairs. If you want to just come for free, you can access it from any of the two entrance points of the free public beach accesses. One's right before the hotel zone, the other one is going toward the Tulum ruins. And then of course, just walk along the beach. The entire beach is free, it is a public beach. You just don't get to enjoy all of the amenities that some of the hotels or beach clubs would offer. The hotel zone is next level. It's literally like nowhere else. The entrances to some of these hotels and restaurants are insane. Everyone always says it's like a tropical eco chic vibe and it honestly describes it perfectly. There's so much wood and just natural elements, green tropical plants and palm trees everywhere. But that brings me to the one downside of Tulum. It is an extremely expensive city. I mean, prices are rivaling the United States in 
some of the most populated cities like San Francisco or New York. Prices all along the hotel zone specifically are going to be really inflated. All of those cute shops, every single thing I found in there was at minimum $100, sometimes upwards of $500 or more. So if you're coming here thinking you're going to be doing like a budget getaway, I definitely think you're gonna be in for a surprise. There are cheap ways to do Tulum. You don't have to spend a fortune to enjoy it, but I think to experience the Tulum that everyone sees and expects, especially through social media, you're going to need to come to the hotel zone and you're gonna to have to spend some money. How are you feeling? I feel much better. Hola. Living life in a Chidrawi parking lot. I don't know how many days we've been here. Longer than I want to admit. But we're in Tulum and there's nowhere else to park. And our first trip to Mexico, we pretty much stuck to RV parks. We didn't feel super safe or comfortable with the idea of just sleeping in a parking lot, especially if it wasn't patrolled um, or policed. But the second go around, we realized it's actually much safer than we originally thought. And we are totally utilizing parking lots all across the country. We've stayed in Pemexes. This is our second or third Shadrawi in different cities. We've stayed just in public parking areas on the beach. So we're definitely okay with that idea now. It's not always the most comfortable, but this Shadrawi has tons of space. So if you're coming to Tulum and RV, the closest RV camping that you're going to find on iOverlander is a dry camping spot and you're going to pay 300 pesos for two people. So we would much rather camp in a Shadrawi parking lot that's a little less glamorous, yeah. but free because we're still without hookups. And we're really close to all of the things Tulum has to offer. We can walk into town to the actual Puebla of Tulum and it's about a 10 to 20 minute drive on our scooter into the beach area. So it's definitely a good spot to explore. All I know is I'm enjoying my coffee listening to the ever so pleasant sound of carts rattling over asphalt. Do you, do you like Shadrawi? The boys decided to stay back at the RVs in the beautiful Shadrari parking lot. So we, Las Chicas, decided to come into Tulum Town to explore a little of the city by day. There's tons of cute shops to enjoy. There's lots of great restaurants. Hopefully we'll find a good happy hour. We're looking forward to seeing what it has to offer. I love that tuk-tuk. They have one in pink and yellow. They're so cute. right on the main strip. They have happy hour every day, so you can get two for one margaritas, mojitos, or daiquiris for about 100 pesos, so like $5 for two drinks. Not a bad deal. We ended up eating the majority of our food in the town of Tulum, just because it was so much more affordable. This is where you're gonna find a lot more like street tacos. There's tons of food vendors you can go to on the streets that are worth trying. There's even vegan food street carts. I ended up getting empanadas tonight, but one place we definitely recommend coming to is Antojitos de Chiapinaca, but they specialize in pastor tacos, which actually comes from Mexico City. Tacos are only 10 pesos, which falls in line with the prices we've seen in the majority of Mexico and is a welcomed treat for our pocket. It's totally a local spot, but tourists also come here because it's become so well known for the pastor. Like, they literally have three, like, grills going at all times with a huge wheel of pastor like constantly. What's the best way to wash down some spicy salty tacos? Ice cream! Right around the corner from the taco shop is a really lovely little ice cream restaurant. So we're gonna grab some sweetness to finish off our night. Oh, yeah. We ended up driving about three and a half hours away to the town of Mahawal which is actually a port town for huge cruise ships which Right now, from COVID-19, cruise ships aren't operating, so it's a little bit of a ghost town. But it's just as beautiful of beaches, just as gorgeous waters, you can snorkel, there's great food, and the best part about it all is we're camping here for free. We're literally in front of the beach, and 
we can explore the town through the Malecon. Malecon is basically a giant foot and bike path that will take you all along the shoreline in the town. All along the Malecon, there's tons of restaurants and beach clubs and public access beaches with cabanas and, and of course tourist shops so you can get all your tchotchke stuff when you get off the cruise ship. But yeah, it's a pretty rat little town. I'm glad that it's sleepy right now because we literally feels like we have the whole place to ourselves. It's not necessarily, I wouldn't say ghost town like Liz said earlier, but it's definitely way quieter than it normally would be. That's for sure. So we ended up finding a cute little restaurant called Tierra Verde. It's like an organic, vegan, raw shop. We could use a little bit of um, a healthy food. So we're gonna get some greens in our body, some vegetables, and then we can relax and enjoy. So, so good, so good. Plantain tacos are super tasty. And the views here, they just can't be beat. Mm. <laughs> Time for the beach. Water is gorgeous today. It's so amazing how crystal clear the water is here. The problem with having a relaxing day at the beach and starting your day off with a delicious lunch out is that you don't want to cook. So we ended up passing a cute little pizza shop that's right below the place we came for lunch, Tierra Verde. So we're grabbing a pizza to go and we're gonna enjoy a little bit of movie night in the RV. We also have another problem where we're out of propane and our solar panels aren't exactly working. So we have no way to recharge our batteries without running our generator, but we're out of propane to run our generator. There's no propane fill-up stations in Mahawal. They just have trucks that come through on random days. So fingers crossed we'll find a truck tomorrow. Because if not, we're in quite a pickle. But for now, we can't solve the problem. So we're just gonna enjoy pizza. someone right as we were about to go home and just kind of call it bus we found a gas company I'm just loving our spot. The first night it was really loud here. We were really worried it was gonna be like that every night, but I think it was an anomaly. It's been super quiet here throughout, but if you are looking for a little bit more of a secure spot than just right here out in the open next to the lighthouse, uh, there is paid RV camping down the beach, uh, past where the Malacone ends for walking or pedestrians. I believe it's like 80 to 150 pesos, depending on the time of year. But for us, this spot has been perfect. 
And if you are an experienced diver, this is definitely a great place for you to do some deep dives. There's tons of dive shops in and around this area. That's a good one. <laughs> Look at this, fancy. Reusable. Uh, Fressons. our last day here in Ma'awal and we decided to treat ourselves to a nice little breakfast out with our new friends. Gracias. Dude, this bread is so fresh and so like soft and crispy the way she grilled it. And the cochinita was very good. I'm excited. ¿Qué piensas? Muy bueno. Bacalar. We tried to find our camping spot, which we found on iOverlander earlier, but unfortunately the road is experiencing construction right now. The construction workers told us that the road would be open in the afternoon hours, which is really vague. We don't quite know when that means we can access the campground, but for now we're just going to park on the street and try and explore a little bit of the area. I got limon and I don't know what else, but it's good. It's something with pecans. I have a feeling this is going to hit the ground. I know. The top one. If you're coming and interested in history, there is a fort here that you can explore. We are not going to be going this time. Normally we do love archaeological zones or any part of history like that, but we're short on time here. We want to really enjoy the lake, which is the shining star of the city of Bacalar. There's really no public access to the lake. Most of the times you have to pay to go to a restaurant or you can pay to access it from a dock. La Playita is the most famous restaurant by a long shot. There was a long line waiting outside when we passed by. We're gonna be looking for something a little bit more local. We ended up passing a really cute little restaurant that ended up serving aguachiles, which is a shrimp specialty dish here in Mexico. And around a lot of coastal regions, you can find aguachiles on the menu, where they like thinly sliced shrimp and they add onion and cilantro and normally a tomato sauce. And it's kind of like its own ceviche where it cooks in the acid from the limes. But this place does it a little bit differently. So they had a ton of different unique flavors like mango y habanero. We ended up getting the jaimaca y habanero, which is uh, hibiscus and habanero chili peppers. It has a nice spice to it. It's not overwhelming, but it's very tasty. It's very good, very fresh.
one thing that will summon this many people this early on a Sunday in the Yucatan. Cochinita P. Beal. This is such a fun way to start the day, getting super fresh, amazing Cochinita P. Beal and then getting to shop at the local markets. I think that's one thing I love about RVing Mexico instead of just visiting, is we get to see a much more authentic side. We get to shop like a local, try new fresh vegetables, and the prices here are amazing. This market had every single type of vegetable or fruit you could want. We totally stocked up. We're, we have some rain coming our way, so we're gonna be cooking lots of tasty meals. Very excited. We've been doing markets all wrong. Juan actually tried to get a specific cut of pork that the butcher told him that we were late to the market to get. So we got here at what, eight? And we were still missing items because we were too late. <laughs> This vendor in particular had two types of cochinita, pibil and relleno negro, which uses a mixture of chilies as a spice instead of achiote. Normally, cochinita served as a torta or taco, topped with pickled onions. We grabbed our cochinita to go, so we could feast at home. Worth a 6.30 a.m. wake up call. Mm -hmm. Bacalar is known for their beautiful lake. The laguna's name is La Laguna de Siete Colores, which means the lake of seven colors. There's some spots that are so brilliantly blue, it looks just like the Maldives. It is crystal clear and absolutely gorgeous. Right now, the lake is not as brilliant or as bright as it normally is. That's because they've been having a lot of rain here this season, but that's okay. So we decided to go to Cenote Azul, which is just outside of the Laguna. There are three more cenotes that are actually a mixture of a cenote inside of the Laguna. You can only get to those cenotes by a boat tour, which when we were in town cost around 250 pesos per person for a two hour tour that took you to three or two of the cenotes. So definitely a decent price. It just doesn't give you a lot of time to explore those places, which is why we opted to come here. It was 25 pesos to enter. They have a restaurant on site if you want to order food or drinks, they have bathrooms and showers, and we can hang out here as long as we want. Unfortunately, it started raining on our parade at the cenote, so we ended up taking the time to move to the campamento that we tried to reach yesterday. Luckily, the road was open, so we were able to get there with no problem. The first one we went to seemed closed, so we ended up finding another spot on iOverlander that actually worked out perfectly. We have a great parking spot, we have a 15 amp plug that we use so we actually can run our AC. We have Wi-Fi here, there's an outdoor kitchen, hot showers, bathrooms, and it is right on the lake. So we have our own private access to swim in the Laguna if we please. You can rent kayaks and paddle boards here as well. So if you're coming here during great weather, this is a wonderful spot to kind of explore the area. Um, I would not suggest coming here in anything bigger than our 20 foot four class C. If you're anything any smaller, you can actually get closer to the Laguna. This was one of the spots I was the most excited about visiting, so it's kind of a bummer to get here and not to be able to experience it in all of its glory. But that's a part of travel. Sometimes the Instagram pictures aren't exactly reality. And this is one of those times. 
I do know it can be this beautiful. We'll put pictures up here of what it can be. But it's, it, I think it depends on how much rain they've got in that season, which right now, even though it's the dry season, which is winter, there's been a lot of rain. So I don't think that's been helping. So if you're coming, hopefully you get to experience more of the picturesque, beautiful bacalar that you see in all of the videos and Instagram and social media stories. We're here, we made it. The beach club that is located at Las Rapidos, it's kind of expensive. It's 150 pesos per person for an entry fee. Los Rapidos is a natural waterway connecting two lagunas. The narrowness of the waterway creates a strong current acting like a natural lazy river. Surrounding the sides of Los Rapidos are stromatolites, which look like limestone rocks but are actually the oldest living organisms on the planet. The few stromatolites that still exist on Earth today provide us with as much oxygen as all the forests and are responsible for creating the ozone layer. Stromatolites can only survive in very rare places where conditions are perfect. So to avoid killing them, it's extremely important not to touch or walk on the stromatolites. Pretty much, don't be this guy. This is so much fun. It's like it's own natural lazy river. Definitely come here if you're coming to Bacalar. I'm going back in. After an awesome week in Bacalar, we made the three-hour drive to the jungles of Campeche, where we'll be visiting Calakmul, one of the most remote archaeological zones in all of Mexico. We're about to do something very exciting. If you're coming to the area to visit Calakmul ruins, you should also make sure to stop by a special cave that's about a 20-minute drive just outside of the entrance of Calakmul. It's just past mile marker 106, or kilometer 106. And there's a cave pull off to the right. You can hire a tour guide to come back at this time. They have people speaking in English and Spanish. It was 100 pesos per person for the tour. And we get to go to a cave to see millions of bats flying out of the cave tonight. Super cool, you get really close to the cave entrance. When you're here and the bats come out, you have to be very quiet to respect the bats since they use their sonar to kind of get around. Being quiet helps them navigate where things are. Eight species of bats live harmoniously inside this cave, making it one of the top three most bat biodiverse caves in the world. The cave is actually a cenote, 600 meters deep, and fresh water can be found around 400 meters in. Every night, as many as three million bats exit the cave in a beautiful dance, spiraling through the air, heading out in all directions in search of their next meal. It's easy to see why the locals have named it Volcan de Morcielagos, the bat volcano. This is cool. This is amazing. I've never seen anything like it. Kalakmul Archaeological Zone is located in the Kalakmul Biosphere Reserve. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site deep inside the largest forest in all of Mexico, with over 723,000 hectares of land. Bordering Guatemala, this massive tropical forest takes up 14% of the land in the state of Campeche and is home to many species of animals, including jaguars, ocelots, pumas, turkeys, howler and spider monkeys, toucans, and tapir, just to name a few. Half of the adventure of visiting Kalakmul is the drive to the ruins, which is 60 kilometers from the first gate. 
and takes roughly an hour and a half one way. During our drive, we passed unexcavated ruins, saw tons of turkeys, fox, and great carousel birds. Because of the sheer size of the reserve, the land and archaeological zone is managed, operated, and protected by three different local and federal groups. So you'll need to pay three separate entrance fees totaling 244 pesos per person to visit the ruins. Kalakmul was built in 550 BC and grew into one of the great cities of the Maya civilization, having control over the entire region until it was abandoned in 900 AD. The city's home to thousands of structures yet to be uncovered, with pathways connecting Kalakmul to other neighboring sites, including Palenque and Tikal, Guatemala who's believed to have century-long battles with Kalak Mool over power. Archaeologists believe Kalak Mool finally rose to supreme power for the area after losing a battle to Tikal. In celebration of the win, Tikal painted their city red, using powder made from cinnabar and mercury-based ore. The pigments of the paint washed off into their water reservoir with rain, unknowingly poisoning the inhabitants and forcing those who survived to abandon the site in search of new water. Now we're in a residential area that had several homes to different people. This barley was made for the middle class because half of the home was built with stone and they would have used wood and palm leaves for the remainder of the walls. Each room you can see has a spot that has a bed to lay down on and then in the center there's like a great dining area that would be used for cooking, gathering, working, that would be used for all of the families here. But even in the middle class neighborhood there was class levels. So if you see behind me, there's no steps in front of this house. But if you turn this way, this has steps and the house itself is much higher than this house over here. So this person that lived in this house was more important. This would have been a nice little spot to put your jewelry. So this is how you know that this was an important person. The beds are much bigger, but also they have special little spots cut out for sometimes jewelry, but if they were a warrior, they could have a spot for their protection, their weapons. Here's a toucan. Oh my god. Right after we see the toucan, I see a tree move. It's a spider monkey. Just with a baby on your back. Oh, for the win! This is awesome! Now that we've seen one monkey, they're everywhere. And we're getting to see howler monkeys. Oh, I hope they make their noise. There's like seven or eight of them and the whole group is coming now. This is so amazing. The building behind me actually isn't originally constructed by Mayans. It was created by archaeologists after it was discovered because this is home to where the original murals were found and they wanted to keep those protected. So they, they built this building behind us to look like the rest of the buildings in the area. This used to be like the common area. You could kind of call it like a market. It's where people used to do their daily lives, come to trade, come to buy things. Across from where the murals are located is another building that is built by the Mayans that has more of the murals and actually they found tombs there. They haven't excavated the tombs to figure out who it was, when they were buried, things like that. So probably just gonna leave it covered for now and protected. The Great City is not actually where the largest pyramids for this area are. It's just where the kings and kind of like all the people making the important decisions for the area would have resided. That is just behind this big entrance, the gate that we just walked through. It is not excavated, so you can kind of see remnants of areas of steps and pyramids that are back there, but right now they're just covered in jungle. The entrance to the great city on the other side of this wall, you saw the first Estela, which was massive and they carved the stellas out of limestone with the history 
for each sitting king or any sort of major event that happened while the city was in power. This one, however, is super small. And that's because at the end of the decline of the city, the last king didn't have enough helpers or workers to create a Stella the size that you saw on the other side. And before the limestone was eroded away, pictographers have deciphered was that basically it said there's no food, there's no water and no people, so we're leaving. And that was the end of history for Kalakmul. That was until they discovered it in the 1930s and it didn't actually become open to public until the 1980s. The road that came out here wasn't even built until 1952. So this is one of the newest significant archaeological finds for the Mayan people in this area. Oh my god, this is so incredible. So this is Edificio 7, Building 7. Right. Incredible views of the two pyramids. And the namesake of the site, which is Kalakmul, which means... Two objecting mountains. Two objecting mountains. At the top of Structure 7, they found Junom Tok Kawil's tomb. And he's super important because he was the last king of the Junom dynasty, which is the dynasty of the snakehead people who did a lot of work bringing the power to Kalakmul. When they found his tomb, they found a bunch of artifacts, but the most important one that you may or may not recognize is a jade mask that depicts Junom Tok Kawil. And it's now become like a symbol of Mexico worldwide and a symbol of the Mayan civilization worldwide. The stairs are so narrow because when you leave, they don't want you to turn your back on the king because that's a sign of disrespect. So you have to go down sideways instead of front facing like a normal set of steps so you don't disrespect the king. Building 2 is one of the most important structures in all of Kalakmul because it represents the three levels that the Mayan people believed existed, which was the upper level, which was saved for the gods, then the human level, which is the plane that we live in today, and then there was the underworld, which is where people would go when they've passed. And there would be nine different levels for the underworld. And inside of the pyramid, it's hidden, you can't see it, but they actually had a portal to what they believed would be the representation of the underworld. The pyramid we've seen behind us represents the human plane and just over this pyramid is another one which represents the plane of the gods. This building was also home to two extremely large stone carvings that would have adorned the front of the pyramid. They would have been finished in stucco and painted with brilliant natural pigment colors. Climbing to the top of this is a workout. I will tell you what, we're doing a lot of walking. This is definitely a full day event. If you plan to come here, plan to spend the whole day. Well, it's so magical to imagine this kind of like, oh, this is a lost forbidden city in the jungle. It would have looked extremely different. And they actually had to take down a lot of the trees to build the stellas that we see here, the buildings that we see, all of the residential areas. They even ha would have even had walkways that were stuccoed so that they had different walking areas. So it actually probably wouldn't have very many trees at all. We just made it to structure three and there are monkeys all around us. I can literally like hear them swinging and see them swinging from the trees, which is so cool. But this structure is one of the newer ones and it is where one of the important kings was buried. Although he's not in the tribe that was the most important for Kalak Mool. He wasn't in a snake head lineage, although he was still a king. He was the king of the bad heads, which is actually the people who were in power before the snake head lineage but they gave over power to the snake heads. But since he was still a king of the people, he got buried with all of the king's rights. So. And they found a bunch of jade masks in there, among other things. So they knew that he was a important 
a person of important significance for this culture. And this is also where Lundell, the person who ended up helping uncover this and become what it is today, he ended up sleeping here when he was doing research on gum trees and after realizing pretty much no one has been here, he decided to carve his name in one of the rocks with the date that he visited so that if anyone came back and found it, they would know that he was there first. But please, don't carve your name in the date that you were here in any of the rocks, anywhere in any archaeology site that you ever go to in the world, please. If you're planning to come to Kalakmul, there's a few things you need to know before you come. Because we kind of figured out a lot of this at like 7.30 in the morning today. The first thing is you are going to need a vehicle of some sort. We technically could have taken the scooter in. The road is paved pretty much the whole way, but there's a lot of loose gravel, low hanging branches, things that have fallen off the side of the roads that kind of make it a hazard. We ended up actually passing someone who was on a bike and crashed their bike and had to get help getting out from Kalak Mool. So I'm glad we didn't take the scooter. Ideally, you need to have a car. RVs are not allowed, so you'll have to park outside in the nearby town, and then you can either, if you don't have your own car, you can rent a car in town. I definitely suggest asking um, a local in the village. They'll probably be able to point you in a direction of someone who can give you a car to rent for the day. Cars should run you anywhere from about a thousand pesos to 1200 pesos for the day. You pretty much get free reign to come into Kalakmul and bring it back to them at the end of the day. But if you want to make all of this even easier, you can hire a guide like we did. We ended up working with Roberto and he has been amazing. A guide can cost you anywhere from 1200 pesos up depending on the season, how much demand there is. Definitely suggest contacting Roberto. I'll have his number pop up here. Also, if you're planning on filming while you're coming to Kalak Mool, make sure you talk to the tourism board in Campeche City. You can do it online and get a drone permit. Don't bring your drone back here and fly it illegally thinking no one's gonna bother you about it because there are guards here that will totally cite you for flying your drone without a permit. We're not flying our drone this time because we didn't plan ahead far enough to get our drone permit from the tourism board in Campeche City. So you're not gonna see any drone footage in here. And here comes the raid. Okay, we are ready to go. We're leaving Kalak Mool today. We ended up staying at a nice little restaurant that actually has really good food called La Selva Comedor y Cabanas. So she has rooms to rent, as well as a giant parking area out front of the restaurant that you can park your van or RV in. And it's only like a five minute drive to the entrance of the Biosfera, which takes you to Kalak Mool and it's about a 20 minute drive to the Bat Cave. And just like that, our Yucatan Peninsula road trip is over. We hope you enjoyed this series. And if you want more, we recommend watching our other Mexico travel vlog, where we journey over 4,000 miles through 15 different Mexican states.